I'm Dr. Manish Nagpal and would be speaking to you about surgery for retinal detachment and uh, PVR. I would like to thank Orbis for facilitating this uh, interaction between all of us. So fasten your seat belts and uh, we go on to a journey of retinal detachment and PVR. So here you see a classic detachment, uh, a bullous detachment, superior bullous with a horseshoe tear. Uh, and for this, the basic managements could be of three types. Uh, typically, a scleral buckling could be done, a pneumoretinopexy could be done, or a vitrectomy could be done. So these are the different options that most surgeons would take uh, based on various situations or their experience or, or what their experience has been about the success rates of each of them. The most popular procedure now is a primary vitrectomy. So scleral buckling works very well for certain kind of uh, detachments. And pneumoretinopexy somehow has not been that successful uh, over a period of years, though certain classic single superior tears, uh, they would do quite well with the pneumoretinopexy also. So at this stage, we have a, a poll question for all of you. For a superior RD with a horseshoe tear, which of the following procedures uh, would you prefer? a scleral buckling, a pneumoretinopexy, or a primary vitrectomy. Okay, so people have clicked and 41% would choose primary vitrectomy, 38% would choose pneumoretinopexy, and scleral buckling would be 21%. So you can see a fairly equal distribution with a more shift towards a primary vitrectomy uh, at this stage. So let's go on to a primary vitrectomy for a classic detachment. Uh, we'll start with the incision. Typically nowadays we use a 25 gauge or a 23 gauge uh, MIVS based approach. And this is how uh, we would put the incisions. Uh, you put in all the three cannulas and then you're ready to start the surgery. And once you go in, the most important part of the surgery is to remove the vitreous. So once you have a good view, you will do a core vitrectomy, visualize the vitreous, see and remove it uh, as far as possible, uh, and this is possible, this particular situation, what I'm showing you is a, with a pre-existing PVD, wherein the vitreous is detached, uh, the hyaloid is already detached from the retina, and that makes it much easier. So all you have to do is go in and remove all the vitreous without having to go and create a PVD uh, in these situations. And then after that, go in and do the next steps. The second example is where you have no pre-existing PVD. So with a detached retina, creating a PVD becomes difficult because the retina is not uh, stable, it is moving. Uh, every time you pull at the vitreous, the retina also moves and it creates more difficulty in separating it because you're worried that you'll pull it too much, you may create a hydrogenic tear uh, and it becomes more difficult. So we usually stain at times with triamcinolone. If you're not visualizing the hyaloid very well, you could use the stain and then uh, that would help you see it better. Uh, although the procedure itself may be variable, younger patients, it's more difficult to remove this vitreous. High myopics, it's very difficult to remove. Uh, but the staining would help you to a large extent. This is another example, another case of a myopic case where you see a triamcinolone stained hyaloid and you can see how it peels off gradually uh, as we use the vacuum uh, and gradually take it, the, peel the whole hyaloid away from the retina and once as it keeps separating, you'll see the wave of the hyaloid uh, separating. And uh, the triamcinolone staining, of course, helps the whole process because you can see it uh, much better. So as it keeps getting uh, clearer, you use the cutter, the vacuum. Uh, as it uh, keeps peeling, you use the cutter to clear off the vitreous. And again, you can see the whole ribs on expanding. And then, see, as you go to the periphery, the adhesions are still stronger. And this is a lattice. and uh, as we peel, you can almost see that it, it starts shredding and creating a tear of its own at times. And so one has to, uh, in these places, trim it rather than totally try to peel it off and just trim and leave it, shave it at that place and, and, and leave it. So this becomes the most crucial part of uh, uh, detachments, the, the vitreous removal, especially in, in, in situations where the hyaloid is, is still attached. And then, of course, once you've dealt with the a hyaloid part of it, then you go and remove the peripheral part uh, as far as possible. So once the hyaloid is detached, uh, you have a freely mobile vitreous, you can remove, you can go to the periphery. Uh, the key is visualization, whatever systems you use, it could be contact, non-contact, 
I personally use contact and um, uh, I, I prefer that uh, visualization to the non-contact variety. And here you can see that this is a typical detachment with a large tear with rolled edges. And uh, we're making sure that we see that very well in our, um, in our view and uh, zoom it up so that you can see the interface of the vitreous uh, close to the retina so that you can remove the vitreous without uh, actually touching the retina as far as possible. So the visualization is important. Uh, any good wide field viewing system uh, with a good microscope, X, Y, zoom, uh, these become mandatory to uh, do this process. And here you can see that we are externally indenting uh, to bring the peripheral vitreous. So at times, if you feel it's a fakey guy and you have difficulty in reaching the periphery, uh, one could indent uh, from the periphery, either an assistant can indent or you could put a chandelier and uh, indent yourself with the, with the other hand. So these are typical uh, processes where uh, you go and remove the vitreous uh, as far as possible, all 360 degrees, and after that do the, the, the next steps as uh, we'll progress. So this is an example of a pre and a post-op uh, in, in such a situation. There's another uh, case with multiple tears, myopic eye, uh, large superior tear and multiple tears. These are uh, multiple lattices which have torn up as the PVD occurred, as uh, occurs many times with high myopics. So you can see a mobile retina, uh, with some attached, partly attached vitreous, and, and uh, as you keep tearing uh, the central part, you go to the periphery again. You can see that uh, with an indentation, this is a fakey chi, so we indent and uh, lower the IOP so that you can indent uh, comfortably and then remove the vitreous close to the uh, retinal attachment. You can also see the cannula uh, in the extreme periphery with these wild field systems. So 360 degrees slowly you go on clearing this uh, this uh, hemorrhage which is there. Uh, this vitreous with uh, heme attached uh, as you can see in this inferior periphery and, 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 and you can remove that and after that of course do a air fluid exchange and then and, and, uh, drainage. So but at the moment, our main concern is the, the vitreous removal as a beginning. And then the next step is, as I said, air fluid exchange, wherein once your vitreous is gone, you can switch to air. The air replaces the fluid, and a freely mobile retina would usually become bullous uh, at this stage, which is a good sign because that means there's no traction. It has uh, lifted. It's, uh, the bullas have formed because the, the air has pushed the fluid uh, through those breaks uh, inside. And then you go to the disc and, and do a complete exchange. And once you've done that, you go to the break, the predefined break, or create a retinotomy based on uh, the ergonomics of the drainage. So here we are aspirating from the break itself. You can see, and, and the retina gradually flattens. Uh, so this is the next step, endodrainage. Uh, uh, and in this case, it was a break that we uh, used to do that. Now, sometimes what happens is that after you've done the air fluid exchange, the bullas form, but the break is too peripheral and is unconnected to the fluid, and you cannot drain from there. So in that case, uh, one of the options is that you push perfluorocarbon, which flattens the posterior retina and pushes the fluid to the periphery, and it allows you to drain uh, from that peripheral area. Uh, and that's where you do the endodrainage. And what PFCL keeps the posterior pole uh, flat through the process, and then, of course, you can... Uh, once it's flattened, you do a retinopexy with laser. This is again another example where uh, after clearing the vitreous, uh, you, you see that uh, once the periphery is clear, you do air fluid exchange and the fluid is not connected initially. So you put perfluorocarbon and then when it reaches the periphery, the fluid, you, you drain from that area and then you confirm the retinopexy. In macula on RDs, uh, after removing the vitreous, it's best that you push some perfluorocarbon in so that your macula always remains uh, attached to the surgery. Because otherwise, if you do air fluid exchange, sometimes the bullas, as you saw in the previous slides, uh, would come to the central part and they would uh, create a, a macular detachment, which you don't want. So in a case like this, uh, uh, as you saw, this was a macula on RD, inferior breaks localized, uh, so we push perfluorocarbon, making sure that uh, this fluid would never come to the, the central part. And then, of course, uh, once you've done air fluid exchange, remove vitreous, you can just aspirate the fluid from those holes uh, without uh, having the macular area involved 
through any part of the procedure because once the macula detaches, it does leave behind uh, some damage. So you uh, have to take advantage of the fact that there's macula on. At this point, I also want to talk about uh, the, the value of valve cannulas. Here you can see turbulence. This is a non-valve cannula and in detached retina, uh, I think its effect is, is, is most obvious. As you can see, there's perfluorocarbon and uh, as soon as we push uh, an instrument inside, everything quietens. But uh, you can see that when uh, we remove the instrument, how much turbulence takes place. And, and this is not so good uh, for the eye because uh, this means that things are moving. There's a lot of dynamics uh, inside the vitreous cavity. It could push uh, some flow carbon in the subretinal space to the brakes, especially with giant retinal tears. Uh, it happens much more often. Uh, but it's something that is not desirable, and, and, and you don't want this kind of turbulence happening. So uh, I always prefer to use uh, valve cannulas for all the surgeries, and that maintains uh, a very good uh, non-turbulent vitreous cavity uh, throughout your procedures uh, uh, to a large extent. And then, of course, the last step uh, in any primary detachment is to uh, do a endo laser. So uh, once you flatten it, you, you seal it with a laser and, uh, or a cryo based on uh, the location and, and seal it uh, totally. At the end of the surgery, uh, this is our typical uh, method of removing the cannulas. We remove the cannula and, and give pressure. Uh, with, a, with a smooth massager uh, that we call just uh, for 10 to 15 seconds. So uh, if it's a fresh case with no silicone oil, uh, one could uh, just do a massage and most of the times the incisions would hold. But if you feel there's a leak, uh, if you put oil inside, uh, those are situations where we, we would always like to suture and uh, with an 80 white fill, which is uh, absorbable and, and usually holds the wound uh, quite well in these cases. So while we're talking of primary vitrectomy, uh, I would like to bring you to the other option that we have, which is the buckling. And uh, we uh, see a decline in the overall buckling uh, procedure, and that's primarily because less procedures are being done. Uh, and so the teaching of these procedures become uh, less and less, and, and so the skill uh, is, is not uh, going further. And um, what we do at our center is that to just make it visible, we use a chandelier-based uh, buckling surgery because now most uh, uh, most uh, people doing retina are used to uh, tectomy-based visualizing systems, the contact or the non-contact. Uh, and, and, and so uh, it becomes very easy for them to adapt to a viewing which is uh, based on vitrectomy-based systems rather than uh, indirect because it has a lot of advantages, as I, I would try and show you. Uh, so what we do is that we do, uh, wherever indicated, we would do a classic buckling, uh, but without uh, the role of indirect ophthalmoscopy. Uh, we use a vitrectomy-based visualizing system. Uh, I use a contact walk uh, SSV system, so uh, I use that. But one could also use any biome or any other non-contact system. So what we do is uh, we, we put in a chandelier, a 25-gauge chandelier, which is uh, typically available with vitrectomy procedures, uh, and, and you insert that, and that creates a, a illumination enough for you to see with uh, any uh, contact or non-contact system. You can see here a, a, a still picture of a view of a indentation taking place inside the eye, and you can see a cryo being done uh, with a cryo uh, mark on this side. And I'll show you a, a video clip of a classic procedure of chandelier buckling. So here you have a myopic eye with a, a infranasal detachment. So you can see that this is a, a indentation going on. Now all the steps are the same as uh, the classic buckling of with indirect ophthalmoscopy, except that you are seeing inside with a, a contact uh, or non-contact based system instead of indirect. All the external steps remain the same. And, and they all happen under a microscope. So you take the localizing stitch, you do a diathermy, define the area of drainage, uh, and then you redo a needle drainage. You can see the fluid coming out uh, from there. And after that, you look inside, uh, look at the drainage site, make sure there's no bleeding. If there's bleeding, you have to give pressure to that. And then you look at the buckle effect, which you can see now. Uh, and the retina is flat with the buckle effect. So, so all those things that you usually would try and look with the indirect uh, ophthalmoscope, uh, you can see it much better uh, with these systems. You can 
you have a much wider view. You have you can zoom in where you feel like, uh, and it's good for teaching because uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy you cannot show much uh, of what you see inside. Even if you put a video on it, it's not something that's uh, so apparent. So here you see sequentially a, a break identified with the cryo lesion uh, coming and then thawing. Uh, and, and after that, we indent uh, externally. After we've done the cryo, we, we localize the break and then take a suture, marking suture there. After that, we define the area of drainage. We drain it, put a buckle, check for the buckle effect, uh, uh, as you can see here. And, um, and this is how we do a typical chandelier-based uh, surgery that you see here. This is another example of a, a young patient with inferior holes. This is very commonly... A, a classic indication for buckling where long-standing old RDs with inferior breaks. So you can see, you can zoom in, you can you can bring the holes close, you can see the whole uh, dynamics much clearer. This is a cryo uh, being done to that area uh, and the hole being covered and then uh, you allow it to thaw and the, uh, the, the reaction uh, gradually subsides from that area. But your aim is to just cover the, the whole lesion uh, in, in, in that area. And after that, you localize, you've taken a suture, you define the area of, uh, of uh, drainage. As you can see, the fluid comes out, some pigments come out uh, from that area. And um, once you're satisfied uh, with the drainage that's happened, then you uh, make sure you keep the pressure on because sometimes uh, these procedures can lead to a small bleed. Uh, so if you keep the pressure on, that bleed would not increase. So here you see that uh, uh, this is the drainage side. You see a white dot uh, here, which is over the buckle as well. These are the holes which we cry out and they are on the buckle and the, and the retina is flat. So, so the view is uh, actually, uh, those of you who do indirect based uh, buckling, you would uh, appreciate that the view is much better than what you uh, see inside. Uh, and especially for teaching purposes, we've published this uh, a long time back in 2013. And since then a lot of, uh, centers, teaching centers have adapted, uh, Duke has adapted this, and they now have been using it for all their uh, buckling procedures and, and are quite happy with it. And over a period of time, we've had a lot of people uh, discussing it uh, at various forums, and they, they feel that this would help uh, uh, keep the, the whole process of sterile buckling a bit alive longer than uh, one could. So the whole... Uh, Everything about these procedures is visualization. That's the key, whether you do a primary vitrectomy or a buckling. Uh, so everything depends on visualization. So make sure you have the right visualizing system that suits you, contact, non-contact, uh, or even indirect ophthalmoscope if, if that's what works for you. So it would be very easy for a surgeon comfortable with vitrectomy-based visualization to adapt to this modality in case there's an indication of buckling and better visualization with zooming capabilities and ability to transmit or record surgery or to a viewing monitor uh, makes it a much better uh, teaching tool. Also, it allows you to sit and do buckling surgery uh, on a microscope instead of all the time bending with the indirect ophthalmoscope, which uh, over a period of time takes its toll on the neck and back of most of the retina surgeons uh, who do buckling uh, in these cases. So at this stage, I have a polling question for you for, that for a classic buckling procedure, uh, what would you prefer during a surgery, an indirect ophthalmoscopy-based visualization or a chandelier-based uh, uh, visualization? Okay, so I think I've been able to convince a lot of people for a chandelier-based visualization. And I think if we have to sustain it, that's probably the way to move ahead. Although uh, those who are very comfortable with indirect would uh, uh, obviously carry on doing so. Uh, either way, it would help the, the process of uh, uh, art of buckling alive in some form or the other. <clears throat> so now that we've uh, gone through the primary vitrectomy or, or buckling for a, a regular igmatogenous detachment, uh, we move on to uh, a more complicated area of the PVR. Now, PVR is when a, a normal fresh detachment starts turning old and then uh, membranes start forming either in the epiretinal plane, in the intraretinal or the or the subretinal plane, and then they start contracting and create uh, all kinds of uh, problems. Now, we've been working on PVR for a long time and have been associated with the, the fifth and sixth editions of the Ryan's Retina, where we co-authored the PVR chapters, and now at the moment working on the seventh edition uh, as well for this. 
and we have a lot of videos on on the book itself so when we talk of pvr the the simplest form of pvr which is a macular pucker uh, is is something that you would very often see associated with a detachment now this is a detachment there's a macular pucker and 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 uh, you would need to go and remove it this is a form of uh, pvr starting and uh, once you see a pucker um, it is uh, now quite well accepted that it's better that you go and also remove the the ilm because um, uh, that may prevent the chances of recurrence of uh, membranes from that particular uh, area so if this is a detached retina pucker has been removed you can still see the residual stria uh, left by the pucker and and then we go on stain with the brilliant blue dye and then uh, gradually uh, remove the uh, the ilm from that area now in a detached retina sometimes the ilm removal uh, can be a little awkward because uh, unlike a flat retina where the retina holds uh, itself on a macular hole or a, a regular pucker uh, and and then you can remove the ilm here the retina again tends to move and uh, and so sometimes uh, it may be simple and sometimes it may be more difficult so at times we use perfluorocarbons to uh, give support and at times uh, uh, you don't need it so best is that you stain it and you can try uh, to remove it if you think it's uh, easily possible to remove without any other adjunct uh, you could just go ahead and remove it but if you feel it's coming in the way the whole mobility of the retina then uh, maybe it's a good idea that after the staining you could uh, perfluorocarbon uh, and and then um, go and remove the uh, the ilm at that stage so uh, let me ask you here another polling question that during vitrectomy for a primary detachment uh, i'm not talking uh, of with or without a pucker but specifically here the question is addressed that would you always peel an ilm uh, would never peel an ilm and would peel only if there is a pre existing macular pucker just like i showed you okay so i'm glad that most people would agree to the fact that um, they would peel an ilm only if there is a pre existing pucker because uh, a lot of surgeons now do it for all primary detachments and uh, i'm not totally sure of the advantage of that because uh, uh, epiretinal membranes are not that uh, common uh, post just a regular detachment and i'm not sure if peeling the ilm uh, would ensure that there is no pucker so uh, i peel it only if there is a existing pucker that uh, require that so this is another example uh, of, a, of a similar situation uh, where uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, you can see the striae which have formed and we removed the pucker and and after that we've stained and we are removing uh, uh, at the ilm from that particular area and here you can see that there's a bit of difficulty so i put perfluorocarbon and the other uh, tip is that always peel away from the disc uh, because the disc would uh, is where the retina gets attached uh, and and it would keep the retina uh, uh, intact while you peel away from the disc like i'm doing right now well if you if you pull this towards the disc you would pull the whole detached retina with you and it may make it more difficult so so pfcl helps you as well as uh, 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 pulling it away from the disc uh, helps you so these are small tips that can can help this whole uh, process uh, better once you are removing uh, a membrane or an ilm uh, under a pfcl uh, detached retina now this is another case which has a much thicker uh, traction pucker which is radiating down uh, inferiorly so here you can see that we remove uh, the thick pucker uh from the macular area and part of it is radiating to all the sides with a thick radiation inferiorly so once that is uh, removed we look for um, uh, how well the retina has uh, has released itself from the traction and you can see that inferiorly there is a hole here with a stretching effect which is still seen after the air fluid exchange so even though most of the retina is flattened there is a traction here so i go on to do a small relaxing uh, retinectomy here Uh, so this is like a customized small retinectomy. Uh, you have to do it where you feel there is persisting traction because this is an inferior area of the retina, and uh, any tamponade you give here uh, is going to be inadequate to uh, give good pressure. So you make sure that the retina is is well released uh, of the traction. You can still see some stretch marks which have relaxed, but um, uh, they may take some time to flatten uh, 
uh, with silicon oil inside uh, over a period of time. Now this is a case uh, of, of buckled many years back and the patient came to us with a recurrence of detachment and you can actually see that the buckle is intruding. This whitish uh, shining area is actually the intrusion of a, a buckle. Now these are very dangerous situations because uh, on one hand you cannot remove the buckle uh, because you're worried that you may perforate uh, that area. So you have to be very careful uh, uh, not to meddle too much with the buckle go and just uh, passively repair the detachment as far as possible. Uh, use perfluorocarbons, flatten, don't use too many other um, variables. Uh, you can see here the intruding buckle, this white hole area. And what we did was also do a, did a lot of laser uh, barrage all around it that suppose it forms another tear uh, at least the barrage would uh, prevent a detachment from uh, increasing in that area. So these are uh, peculiar situations and uh, happen with many, many years of buckle being inside uh, over a period of time, especially myopic eyes with thin scleras, you can uh, get these uh, quite often. Now this is again a case of PVR with no classic uh, uh, puckers, but you can see a lot of stria star folds with ill-formed star folds. Now here, uh, what works best is, uh, because when you go and peel, you may not find a membrane that easily. So uh, it's a good idea to stain this. Uh, once you remove the vitreous, you go and uh, put a stain inside, and then uh, as you wash out the residual PFCL, put perfluorocarbon, that helps uh, stain uh, uh, that whole area of the retina very well. And, and then you could uh, look for a membrane edge. Uh, you could also use a finesse loop at times, uh, by gradually moving it, ironing it over these folds, you can uh, achieve both the things. You could iron out the folds as well as if there is a, uh, a membrane, you may be able to find an edge or you may be able to find the ILM which uh, in those areas which may help you release the ill-formed membrane uh, uh, quite well. So this is something one could use uh, in, in situations with uh, ill-formed star folds which with no definite uh, areas. This is uh, I think the post-op image of, of this particular case. This is another case with a thicker traction membrane, which is also forming a scar on the central part of the retina, but uh, no specific area uh, of membrane except the one which is near the macula. So here you can see that the, the stain helps you uh, ascertain the extent of uh, where it goes, and then you could take its help to to uh, remove the traction and relieve the central area as far as possible. So this is a bit of a chronic traction and you can see a lot of stretching, uh, loss of elasticity here, a contraction, but uh, once you release the, the gross traction, it may help uh, uh, that central area to get a little more anatomically uh, uh, malleable to a normal macula. This is, you can see this is the post-op uh, photo after the month of this and you can still see that uh, the, the lack of differentiation of the retinal tissue because it was so chronically pulled that uh, it's, it's very difficult for it to get back to normal but it will over a period of time flatten and the rest of the retina flattens and which may uh, make the vision a bit better for these patients. This is another case where uh, you see a classic detachment with the central star folding and, and these are easier to identify because the radiation start from the macula uh, and, and I often use perfluorocarbon to, uh, as soon as I remove the core vitreous uh, uh, and done a basic vitrectomy, I would put perfluorocarbon and then remove the pucker because uh, it helps you identify uh, up to what extent the contraction is and, and, and helps you with the whole process while you can identify traction and then take care of uh, those areas. This is again, uh, a detachment with multiple areas you can see of uh, contractions happening. So uh, as I said before, I'll put perfluorocarbon. It uh, immediately opens up the funnel uh, to some extent and gives you the first view of where the, the membrane or the star fold is. And then uh, as you release the perfluorocarbon pushes the retina back and, and gives you uh, uh, almost a certainty that that retina is, is flat and then you can proceed to the periphery. So in this particular case, um, uh, the peripheral part also needed a, a release and you've done a retinectomy and you can see that we put it uh, back. This is uh, multiple times operated cases where these contractions uh, come up. 
Now, this is a case of uh, extensive uh, PVR, uh, which uh, you can see that there's a lot of radiations of the folds with centrally the vitreous is, uh, is organized. There are large tears with uh, folded margins on, on this side. So, uh, first of all, you have to create space by removing the central vitreous, and, and that's when you get a view of uh, and remove all the vitreous which is adherent and also all the vitreous um, adherent to the edges of the, the brakes. And uh, you can see that that's the first thing that uh, we are trying to release because uh, unless you release uh, all this, it will become more and more difficult. And once you have some space, then you put perfluorocarbon, uh, it would go uh, uh, and gradually up to the edges of the brake, uh, not to inject too much because it may jo instantly jump into the brake otherwise. Uh, so once you have a flat posterior pole, you can then work on uh, the peripheral part. So here you can see that uh, we are removing the, the stuck membranes to the peripheral part of the retina. At times you could also use your light pipe as a second hand, uh, or if you need more manipulation, you could put a chandelier and then uh, put uh, two instruments inside to, to deal with this. So gradually uh, we segregate that the whole vitreous content from uh, all these areas. You can see almost a 360 degree uh, stiff adhesion is there of the vitreous uh, attachment. And, and we gradually remove uh, all, all around. There's also a buckle in these cases that these kind of aggressive ones, we would use a buckle, so there would be a buckle in the periphery. And here you can see that I'm further staining it to uh, still identify and release because the retina still does not look uh, uh, so uh, uh, traction free, even though th there seems to be an inherent contraction. So, so the more and more you can release, uh, you're better off. So you can see here that at the end of the surgery, uh, it, it has flattened and then you do an extensive laser on it. Uh, and then oil, of course, to uh, give tamponade to these areas. At times, uh, there is a radiating uh, subretinal band that you can see here. Uh, uh, which which can hold the the retina uh, uh, as a, as a stretching effect because at times they are flat and you don't need to do anything you can just let them be while you flatten the retina but at times if it doesn't uh, settle or if you see obvious traction you can remove them so here as you see that we pulled it but it it uh, broke uh, because it's it's extending to the other end of the retina so in that case you can also leave it because you've released it and the retina would Flatten. While in this case, uh, we could pick up the strand from the other end and, and that part also came off. But if you cannot remove it easily, then it's best to just release it so that um, it does not apply undue stress to the retina while uh, it can settle uh, without having to totally remove the band because it can be traumatic at times. Now, this is a case of more aggressive uh, PBR, you can see that there's a, a much significant contraction inferiorly, uh, which is there. There's probably a buckle as well, and but still uh, the retina is contracted. So here, once again, after clearing the vitreous, put perfluorocarbon, uh, and, and then the, the typical thing that I, want, uh, I would do is put perfluorocarbon and then remove the membrane from the central part, uh, which is identified at this stage. So perfluorocarbon, as long as there are no posterior breaks uh, uh, with traction, uh, you can always use it. If you have posterior breaks, that's the only time that one would be wary of uh, using perfluorocarbon because with traction, the perfluorocarbon tends to go behind uh, very easily. So uh, most of these cases will not have a posterior break. They'll have the classic peripheral breaks and, and this is the way you would go. So here you can see that uh, we've planned a retinectomy uh, we did diathermy to the big vessels uh, in the whole area where that we are planning to cut. And, and after that, we go ahead and uh, cut the whole retina peripheral to it. And, and this is how it looks like uh, at the end. Make sure you always have perfluorocarbon uh, uh, kind of there as a safety uh, belt uh, in the whole posterior pole up to the edge of the, the retinectomy. Because uh, treat it like a giant tear. Uh, it holds that area while you do the other manipulations and also if there is a bleed from the retinectomy site, uh, it would uh, prevent it from going to the posterior area. So I always use perfluorocarbon uh, uh, in, in these cases.
Now this case uh, has PVR, but also has subretinal oil. Uh, so here you see contractions which are there, and then inferiorly there is a subretinal oil which also holds. So uh, here once again, these are vitrectomized eyes. Uh, we've removed the oil, and now you can see that uh, put perfluorocarbon and remove the posterior uh, pucker which is there, and you can see the releasing effect on the posterior pole. And then as you increase perfluorocarbon, you can see that the subretinal uh, oil comes out inferiorly from the from the pre-existing break of contraction. And uh, we uh, just like the previous case, we do diathermy and prepare and do a good retinectomy in this case to, to release that area. This is another case uh, with uh, uh, previously operated with oil inside and now has PVR with subretinal oil. Uh, so here, your first aim is to remove the oil uh, from the vitreous cavity. Um, you let the whole oil go out so that you can assess exactly how bad is the traction. And uh, once this oil is out, you can then get a good view. There is subretinal oil here. There is a lot of fibrosis contraction uh, which has built up. So at this stage, you inject perfluorocarbon. Uh, so perfluorocarbon becomes a very important tool for such. So as you keep on increasing, you can see that it pushes the, the oil globule passively and uh, then it comes out from the uh, inferior area and comes out and then you can remove it uh, separately. So, and after that, once that oil has come out, you assess the residual traction. Uh, it's a, you do diathermy, prepare for a retinectomy because this is too fibrous to retain. And uh, so all the major vessels are diathermized and then you cut peripheral to it. Also keep, uh, uh, keep yourself ready for raising the pressure in case you see a bleed happening, just raise it to 60. Uh, make sure you diathermize the, the bleed before it increases. And you can see how well the perfluorocarbon uh, keeps all the posterior pole at bay while you do these uh, procedures. So you can see a small bleed in the periphery, but it has not come beyond the edge. So it gives you time to take care of these situations before, uh, otherwise this blood would straight away trickle to the posterior pole and, and create more problems for you. This is another case. Uh, you can see myopic with extensive contraction and uh, also has a subretinal oil. But unlike the previous case, it doesn't have an opening. So uh, here anyways, we, we, had to, we have to do a relaxing retinectomy. So, so we release it in the area of the huge globule which is there. Uh, in, in this particular area. And, and you can see that once that area is released, the, the globule would come out uh, and, and uh, allow you to then assess the residual uh, traction, which is there. So here, after we've uh, released this part, we also go on to the, the, the left, on the left, uh, the nasal area as well, and then release uh, all that contraction, which is there. Uh, you can see there's still a, a contraction which is going from uh, the horizontal meridian. So you have to do various areas of relaxation uh, till you make sure that you gradually, when you inject the, the PFCL, you could flatten the retina. And uh, at times you may also have to do some radial uh, nicks to release these tractions. So, so here you can see that this irregular shape of the whole uh, retina is formed, but that's the only area which we, one could retain with uh, releasing the traction in this particular situation. This is again to show you example of inferior retinectomy. We have uh, removed oil and there is a, a inferior detachment with PVR. So uh, put perfluorocarbon, uh, do a diathermy to all the big vessels. Uh, perfluorocarbon is bordering uh, the interior part of your retinectomy site and keeping you safe. Uh, while you cut the retina uh, beyond the diathermy mark and uh, try and remove as much of the peripheral retina as possible uh, because this is a redundant retina which uh, becomes a scaffold for future proliferation. Sometimes new vessels form on these uh, and also create problems. So uh, make sure you remove all this uh, tissue uh, which, is, which is there before you proceed. And you can see these small oozes which come. Uh, make sure you raise pressure, stop them. Uh, but the advantage is that the perfluorocarbon will not let it trickle uh, to the central part.
Now, this is a, a large tear, a giant tear with a very aggressive PVR that you see. Uh, so, a normal detachment with PVR is one thing. Uh, with a giant tear, the problem is that you don't get a hold. Uh, whatever you inject or do, everything starts to spill over. So, one has to do it uh, very carefully. So, I injected PFC only in the central part uh, gradually and then remove more vitreous, uh, assess more as to what can be done. So gradually keep on increasing the PFCL uh, and then assessing uh, how, how we can, which area needs to be released. So here you can see that there's a contraction, this whole area is folded onto itself uh, and, and we're gradually uh, releasing that whole area. You can see this whole uh, infolding of the retina which has happened in this area. So as we release the traction and put more PFCL, then under PFCL, try to uh, iron it out uh, gradually. And, and slowly you can see the, the shape of the macula uh, coming back, which was totally folded onto itself uh, because of this tear. So uh, these situations, one has to be careful uh, uh, how to proceed because very easily the perforocarbon can go back and complicate things for you with PVR. And so once we flattened it, you can still see this radiating fold superiorly. Uh, and so uh, at this stage, I decided that I need to do a radial retinectomy and release this uh, so that this area gets uh, relaxed. Otherwise, this area will keep again attraction on and uh, create a, a, a torsional effect on the retina to a large extent. So, so these things you have to uh, judge based on a case-to-case -case basis and and, and add these uh, retinectomies along, uh, and not just a classic uh, uh, circumferential retinectomy is always uh, right. This is another similar case. You can see that there's barely any retina on the sides and a lot of contraction. And you can see that we've uh, released uh, a, a lot of areas and then there's still a lot of folding. Uh, now here we use an instrument called the massager that we've developed for uh, massaging macular holes and such kind of cases where there are uh, folds. So here you can atraumatically uh, uh, kind of iron out these folds. Uh, you don't have to use your cutter or a soft tip to do it because they can become traumatic. This is a round bodied small uh, instrument uh, which can be used to iron out these stiff folds uh, of PVR which are there, especially in these kind of cases which have uh, very uh, taut traction. So once you release the traction, uh, retina tends to gather onto itself. So this way you can iron out and gain more surface area uh, before you can do the uh, uh, laser in these cases. Now this is a giant retinal tear, uh, which is very posterior. Uh, you can see that it's uh, posteriorly placed and along with it, there's a macular hole. So uh, this becomes tricky because the macular hole is uh, very close to the posterior uh, area. So here, first of all, you remove the vitreous, uh, you, you remove uh, uh, this whole blood stain vitreous, the hyaloid creation, which is required so that the whole retina relaxes. Uh, and, and once you finish that, you have to look at the macular area. Uh, and here, uh, we're removing the ILM and uh, we take the ILM right up to the temporal edge of the tear because here there is a traction up to the temporal area. So uh, it's best that when you're removing the ILM, keep on extending it to the extreme periphery because that would help release some of the contraction which is, uh, which is there in this uh, whole temporal area uh, present because of the tear. So you can see that I'm extending it right up to the periphery. And, and the whole ILM up to this area is, is gone. And, and there's also folded retina here, which we are uh, unfolding to some extent to gain surface area. And then of course, do a, a, a laser of few rows uh, in that area. Now, this is a case of a giant tear, which is folded onto itself and also is inferiorly attached. Uh, it's almost like a, uh, just a few degrees are attached inferiorly. So uh, once you identify, after removing some of the central vitreous, you identify uh, the opening of, 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 the, of where the disc is. And then your first step should be to put perforocarbon because that's the only thing which will uh, keep the retina pushed away while you can do more vitrectomy and 
and make sure that the retina flattens. And as you can see, when I pushed uh, so much PFCL, because of the inferior attachment, suddenly the PFCL would tend to go spill over because there is traction in the inferior side. So here we convert it into a 360 uh, giant tear. So one has to consider this uh, because otherwise the PFCL uh, would not uh, flatten the whole retina and would spill over. And, and you can see there is a certain contraction to it which was holding on, on the inferior side uh, and creating that uh, effect. But once you make it 360, it becomes easier uh, to, to flatten that whole uh, retina eventually uh, with that. So these are some of the examples of uh, post-op of a patient who's underwent a large retinectomy. You can see these laser marks. And typically uh, for resurgeries with bad PVS, with inferior retinectomies, we would do a, a, a much more aggressive uh, laser inferiorly because uh, that's an area which reproliferates and is best that you almost do like a small mini PRP uh, in that area to, to make sure that the recurrences are, are less in these cases. So these are some of the examples of, uh, of uh, uh, how we manage a detachment uh, with various modalities as well as uh, take care of PVR based on simple puckers to going on to uh, thick membranes to inferior contractions, star folds, uh, using dyes, uh, retinectomies, uh, perfluorocarbons. So all these things uh, go hand in hand, but the most important part is visualization. And I think uh, wide field visualization with good view uh, whatever procedure you use is, is mandatory for all these cases. And, uh, uh, and I think uh, we're coming to the end of the talk. Uh, any questions which are there uh, or not answered through the talk, uh, I think you can type in and I will try and answer them uh, uh, to the best of what is remaining from the talk. And I would like to thank Orbis at this stage for uh, facilitating this once again and allowing us to interact on this, uh, this forum. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Nagpal. Um, there's about three questions so far, if you want to open up the Q&A. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first question is, uh, uh, I'd like to know when you decide not to do surgery. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what you exactly mean, but I probably mean that it's a very long-standing detachment uh, and uh, one may not decide to do a, a surgery. So that would be based on uh, how how long the history is. Is it an exotropic eye with a very long standing detachment or a or a disc? Uh, uh, or you meant RD surgery? Okay, sorry. So uh, that clarified. So when not to do RD surgery? So we do RD surgery in young patients with single breaks, uh, inferior breaks, uh, dialysis, uh, wherever the lens is clear in the younger patients, but if there are multiple breaks or older patients, pseudophagic, uh, all those we would do primary surgery. So uh, buckling is left for the, the younger patients to a large extent with clear uh, lenses where I think it's most important to do an external buckler. Uh, do you keep PFCL in the eye postoperatively for sustained retinopexin for how long? Uh, for typical cases, uh, we would not use it postoperatively. The only time we keep it is for a bad trauma cases uh, where there is a totally mangled retina with subretinal blood and bad choroidals. Uh, and if you've managed to salvage the retina back, uh, and because there is a lot of blood in the subretinal space, uh, those cases we at times put perfluorocarbon, and then we keep it for uh, two to three weeks. Uh, and after that, go in and check uh, do some more laser and, and then replace it with silicone oil at that stage. So so those cases, I think, for fluorocarbon postoperatively is, is quite good. But we don't do it for regular PVRs or, uh, or regular detachments uh, in a typical way. We just use it intraoperatively. The next question is, uh, if macula on occurs during vitrectomy, how can I manage it? Uh, I guess you probably mean macula off uh, occurs during vitrectomy because if macula is on, it's best, as I said, to uh, retain it. You you should uh, just keep it uh, pressed with perfluorocarbon while you do the other procedures 
And if the end removes the per flow carbon when you once you know that the retina is flat after an endo drainage, uh, because after that the blood uh, the the fluid is not going to come to the macular area. The next is uh, is air PFCL exchange or PFCL silicon oil exchange advisable in GRT to prevent slippage? Yes. So these are the two uh, ways that uh, one of the two ways that most surgeons would use. So uh, the direct exchange would have less chances of slippage but if uh, air pfcl exchange is done properly uh, which is which means that you keep the periphery dry you keep the edges of the tear dry uh, through the air fluid exchange air pfcl exchange then uh, usually slippage doesn't occur uh, the second time a slippage occurs is if there is persisting traction or a contraction uh, which has not been resolved and and you're trying to do the exchange that then again a slippage may occur but if uh, uh, one prefers the PFCL oil and is happy doing it, then that has less chances of slippage uh, in either situation. So what are the outcomes in retinal, uh, in RD surgeries done in PVR grade Cs? Uh, outcomes would be variable based on how good the macula is, how good the disc is. Uh, you could have an anatomically settled retina uh, in most situations with PVR grade C. Uh, but the visual equity may vary from uh, counting finger 3-4 meters to, to almost 6, 12, 6, 9 also. So uh, it would vary on what has happened before. Is it the primary surgery for PVR? Is, has, have multiple surgeries happened and then you are doing it and how long it's been? So, so it would be variable. But anatomically, I think if you uh, use all the steps that we discussed or the cases I showed you, I think one could put it back, uh, the retina can go flat uh, in most situations. Uh, indications for encirclage vitrectomy. I think any case of PVR and encirclage may be helpful. Uh, uh, I don't do it for all the cases, but whenever I feel there's a contraction uh, or a traction persisting, I would always encourage you to put a buckle. It would help you through the vitrectomy. It has multiple benefits. Uh, one is that it uh, releases the circumferential contraction. Uh, it helps you visualize the peripheral which is better during the surgery. Uh, and of course, uh, 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 reduces the uh, need for a retinectomy or reduces the size of a retinectomy because you achieved a little contraction release uh, by the buckle itself. Have you experienced any side effects from retained PFCL in any of your cases and how do you deal with those? Uh, frankly, we use it for uh, such bad traumatic cases that uh, I'm not even sure what side effects to look for because the the pathology of with bad trauma itself uh, leaves a lot of uh, effect with the blood inside. The disc is uh, affected. But uh, in the past, uh, we have used retained PFCL for giant retinal tear cases. But I'm talking of almost 15, 20 years back uh, uh, when wide angle systems were not there and we used to uh, put PFCL for two weeks and then remove it. So I don't think we found any specific problem with uh, retaining PFCL in those cases uh, and they did pretty well. Uh, so if you keep it for two weeks, uh, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, if you keep it for a month or more, uh, maybe there may be a mechanical pressure problems. You could see atrophy, you could see uh, a disc which is paler than what you would expect. But uh, in a couple of weeks, nothing is going to happen with perfluorocarbon. And the advantage of perfluorocarbon is that it keeps moving. Uh, unlike other tempo nuts, uh, it's, as the patient moves the head, it keeps moving. So it never compresses the same area uh, all the time uh, and, and does not lead to pressurize also in most situations from our experience. How about anteriorly closed funnel RD? Well, they have very poor prognosis. Uh, uh, you have to go in with an explained prognosis to the patient that uh, you may not be able to anatomically settle uh, in surgery. So uh, the patient needs to understand that you're going to try and open it, uh, but uh, during surgery, you may have to give it up because it's so contracted. But nevertheless, if, if the, you explain to the patient and if you've gone in, there are cases where uh, once you start opening up, it may open up better than what you expected because the adhesions were uh, not that strong. It was only the vitreous which was holding a lot of retina uh, and not that the retina itself was contracted so much. While there may be other cases where 
uh, you remove the vitreous and then the contraction is so severe that uh, even after doing a retinectomy, you may not be able to put it back. So, so it, it is variable and a very poor prognosis. When do we remove clear lens with RD? Uh, actually, never. Uh, clear lens is never removed. Uh, we only remove a lens if, uh, if there is a cataract along today because uh, in no situation uh, is the lens coming in your way. Uh, if you, you can always indent and do a peripheral clearing of vitreous uh, without touching the lens in most situations. So today, I don't think we, we would ever do a clear lens removal just for a detachment per se. Uh, 